this was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. Well, the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow this head off. I feel something pulling at my leg. And I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. To the confessionals, I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at protonmail.com. That's theconfessionals at protonmail.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the contact section, and you can reach us that way as well. Either way works for us. Just get a hold of us. And if you're interested in extra shows every week on Thursdays, we release member-only episodes on the website. So if you're interested in becoming a member and getting more of The Confessionals every week, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com and hit join today. And to let you guys know, we are offering gift cards for an annual membership one-time fee you can gift to somebody that loves the confessionals or you can have somebody gift to you if you want a gift of the confessionals membership for an entire year we're offering that through december 2019 so if you're interested in that get on it by going to the confessionalspodcast.com hit the join section and when you look at the options you'll see one that says gift a membership That is the one that will give you the opportunity to gift a membership to somebody or to yourself. And if you haven't noticed, we did change our email address. After talking with Zach Voorhees, the Google whistleblower, I decided we were going to start transitioning away from Gmail and Google. So that is the first step of many steps that I need to take to slowly transition the show away from Google. We are now on ProtonMail. If you do emails to the Gmail account, it's okay. It's set to forward to our ProtonMail. And I'm also looking to have a more custom email address coming down the road. But for now, it is the confessionals at ProtonMail.com. Now, this week we have Christian coming on, and Christian's going to be sharing a lot of different stories. He has some Bigfoot photos that he's come across, but one of the things that I find most fascinating is that his grandfather has a very interesting history where his grandfather was on Operation High Jump with Admiral Byrd in 1947. His grandfather was a medic on that mission, and he talks about that all on this show. So without any further delay, let's get to Christian right now. All right, today we have Christian on the line. Christian, how you doing, man? I'm doing well, Tony. How are you? Doing well, man. So you're down there in Jacksonville, Texas, and you have some interesting stuff to talk to us today. Uh, you have some paranormal experiences that you've experienced, and uh, you also had some Bigfoot stuff, whether it's an experience where you heard something or even, I guess, a family friend or something like that. Uh, actually had pictures of these things that lived on the property and they were showing you. But I want to kind of kick things off with your grandfather who was on an Arctic expedition with Admiral Byrd. So if you could just share with us the information that you know about that, but also share with the audience who Admiral Byrd is, because some people may not know. Yeah. Um, Well, like I said in my email, if there's something weird, if it's a weird story, my family somehow has an attachment to it. And (laughs) I guess it all kicks off with Operation High Jump, which was an American mission right after World War II. My grandfather was a medic on this mission, and Operation High Jump was from 1960 or 1946 to 1947, and 
right after World War II, they had several objectives of this mission. There were uh, it, it, there was equipment that they wanted to test in very cold conditions. I can verify that that happened. There were many scientific tests done, but the big appeal to this Antarctic mission was to seek out any information, look for any you know evidence of Nazi bases that could be in Antarctica. And it's documented that in 1939, possibly a few other times, but for sure in 1939, Nazi Germany took an interest in Antarctica, and they went to an area known as New Swabia now uh, to hopefully establish a whaling base. Now, the U.S. thought that there might be a little bit more to this, and Operation High Jump was basically a bunch of men gathered together. I don't know if there were multiple locations that they left from. My grandfather left from San, Di- uh, from San Diego, California, and he was a medic aboard the Northwind, which was the flagship of this operation. And he was led by Richard Admir- or Admiral Richard Byrd, who was very notable in the U.S. military. He was one of the big explorers at the time. He had done, you know, adventures that no one could have dreamed of he was he was the first guy to to document a lot of the unexplored places that were still around in in the mid 40s um and one of those is antarctica and when he came back he faced a lot of scrutiny for some of the things that he said and a lot of the things that he had you know documented about this he was very open about it and this was you know before the military and pop culture kind of separated you know in the mid 40s these big military heroes were very much a part of pop culture so when he came back from operation high jump he was kind of this big hero he had done all these television interviews talked about antarctica being kind of the last frontier and urging you know america as as a world superpower to now, go forward with studying Antarctica, go forward with looking into, you know, what benefits can we get from possible colonization or scientific study of Antarctica. But High Jump was a big part of that. And it's been surrounded with all sorts of UFO folklore, you know, Middle Earth folklore. A lot of people say, oh, they could have seen a hole to the middle of the earth they could have seen aliens now a lot of people do say that bird wrote in journals about some very strange craft that he had seen there are also mysterious deaths surrounding the operation and it, you know as far as that my grandfather never said much you know it, he did note that yeah a big part of it was to look for existence of these bases and that was after, you know, it, it had been kept quiet for decades. People had been allowed to talk about it. And no one really knew what happened. But they had sent, I believe, about 4,700 men to Antarctica, which is a lot to send for some simple scientific testing. And one fun fact I have from that is that my grandfather, along with one other men, did the initial study on guinea pigs while en route to Antarctica, uh, which eventually became pretty much the primary study used to, I guess, back the use of fluoride in toothpaste. So he and this other man had done all this testing, and we still have a lot of these notes from those exact tests, but this was pretty much the initial study on the effects of fluoride in toothpaste. And being part of this mission, he was not able to take full credit for it uh, or apply for any patents or anything like that. But he and this other man, you know, had a huge part in medical history while on this expedition. And that was a pretty cool, you know, tie that my family had in with, with history. 
Yeah, that is really cool. And it is a shame that your grandfather isn't going to get the appropriate acknowledgement to his contributions to science like that. Uh, but, you know, it's pretty much the military owns you. Therefore, anything you produce, the military owns. And, uh, you know, Admiral Byrd and that whole uh, convoy that going down there, like you said, there are so many different rumors about that. And I don't know what's true, what's not true. And I've heard very credible people talk about uh, the, you know, bizarre things that supposedly happened. And it's all, you know, supposedly written down in Admiral Byrd's uh, diary, things like um, the outside temperature indicators being 74 degrees as they're approaching uh, Antarctica, you know, basically saying that there was some kind of metropolis down there that was very sustainable of life. Uh, then also the plane being taken over, engine stopping and something steering the plane, um, something coming over the radio, talking to Admiral Byrd like they were expecting him, uh, sounding like it was a German accent. And I think they, they even talk, there's even rumors of talking about there being UFOs down there that had uh, Nazi symbols on it. And what I do find interesting about that is that uh, we do know that the Nazis did build flying saucers and there were Nazi symbols on it. And that there's, that's well documented. There's actually very many pictures of these crafts that they were building during that time. So that does kind of correlate. Uh, but the story of this diary is just so bizarre. It's hard to know if it's real or not and all that stuff. But you mentioned about the inner earth stuff. Um, supposedly, they, they were able to actually what fly into inner earth. Uh, I, I think if I, I'm remembering that correctly. So very fascinating stuff. And the fact that your grandfather was involved with that is just really cool, man. Yeah, there was uh, Roswell happened right after this expedition and then UFO folklore in America really started to take off. And I'm sure that's, you know, influenced the stories to some extent, but you know, I have no clue how some of this information is available, what's been hoaxed, what's been made up, but it's, it's just a really good story. Yeah. That's always a good question to ask is how is this information available? I mean, we know that the government does release uh, documents and stuff that, I personally don't understand why they would release because it really is incriminating. Um, like Operation Northwoods. I mean, that, that I think it's Operation Northwoods. I, I think I remember that correctly. But basically, it's it's a whole laid out plan of how our government was going to attack itself, attack our own country and blame it on Cuba. Uh, and fortunately, it well, unfortunately, it went all the way up through the ranks to the de desk of the president and JFK uh, put a stop to it. And some people say that's why he one of the reasons why he was killed. Uh, but it, it laid out this whole plan of how our government itself was going to use um, Cuban friendlies to basically do terrorist attacks on our soil to promote this problem with uh, Cuba. They were going to actually um, have a plane of people take off and then replace that plane at some point with a drone where the plane was going to land and the drone was going to take over. They were going to shoot the drone out of the sky and say that Cuba shot down a plane of our people and all these different things that was listed in this, this uh, document. And, uh, you know, who, who's to say if uh, JFK actually was for it, what would have happened, you know? So uh, very interesting stuff. There's a lot of hidden things from our, uh, from our eyes and our knowledge on the government's behalf and stuff. And I just always found Admiral Byrd's story very interesting. And I'm really, I, I think it's really cool that your grandfather was involved with it. Yeah. Uh, another thing that it recently became declassified was that the Pentagon was actually looking into some of the, you know, pilot reports of unidentified flying objects. Yeah. Now that's something that's more recent, right? Yeah, I, I believe that was within the last two years when that came out. Um, but, you know, that's that's one step uh, that that a lot of, you know, ufologists or UFOologists, however you like to pronounce that, that's one step they said is crucial in getting, you know, lots of people to believe that, hey, we may not know everything yet. Our own government is looking into this and willingly admitting it. Right. And that's the thing. I mean, how many times do you have to hear ex-military or even current military pilots saying they've seen things that they, their own planes couldn't keep up with, like dramatically? Uh, you see these videos and stuff that 
are popping up where pilots are able to record this strange light that's flying faster than uh, the plane is flying. Uh, and then you have things like you were just talking about. I mean, that made all the way to the mainstream media. I mean, I remember the mainstream outlets were covering the fact that our government spent, I think it was like $2.5 million investigating these UFO things. I think if I, maybe it was $12 million, I don't remember. But uh, they had all this breakdown and stuff. And I was like, wow, this is really really cool because there's some kind of disclosure happening right now. And then just kind of fell apart. Like, just move on. You know, let's not talk about it anymore. I'm just like, what's going on, you know? So, uh, but yeah, it's, I find it very fascinating, man. Uh, so that's not, uh, you know, the extent of all your experiences because, uh, that's, maybe that's the beginning of your experiences. Maybe let me ask you before we go into anything that you have experienced personally, uh, do you think that this is a marker on your family history as to maybe what curved your family into experiencing weird things, your grandfather being part of this expedition? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. It's, it's always one thing that we've thought was very interesting with our family. Um, but in terms of, that leading into experiences i i don't know uh i kind of said in the email that you know a lot of people end up having experiences when they start to look they gain an interest and then they gain experiences for my family and myself it was always the opposite um you know having these experiences happen and then kind of a desire to want to know what just happened and so I've heard a lot of people say phrases like I didn't ask for any of it. And now it's, it's kind of been, you know, <laughs> tugging away and just bothering me uh, that I don't know everything, but that's more how I would describe it. I'm not sure if you know, that had anything to do with it, but I think that's where everything starts being weird with my family. Yeah, I'd say so. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I just know that sometimes people feel that uh, there are certain things that happen in their family timeline that was a marker as to the experiences that everybody's had since then. And uh, obviously, your grandfather working with Admiral Byrd on this expedition is, whether it's a paranormal m marker or not, it is a marker on your family's timeline. I mean, that's really cool. And most people in the world can't say that they have a relative that worked with Admiral Byrd on this Arctic expedition, nevertheless. So uh, I find it very interesting. But you had some paranormal experiences. And I think the first one you said started when you were four years old. Am I right? Yeah, I, I would have been about four years old. Uh, that's, I'm pretty much looking at the house right now. Um, so my grandparents have property right here outside of the city. Uh, I live outside of Jacksonville, Texas, which is a very small East Texas town, very wooded. And we live, you know, on the outskirts of the city. Now my aunt and uncle have a property on the other side of the county road that we live on, and we're separated by um, maybe 50 or 60 meters of woods in between us. So it's a lot of these experiences happened in the same general area. And I was about four years old. She had recently, my aunt had recently moved into a house. She had a husband and two kids that were slightly older than I was at the time. Um, my parents and I went over, I'm not sure what the reason was for visiting. I'm sure they were having a game night or just catching up or something like that. But I know that it was not necessarily notable or any big event or anything like that. So everyone would have just been normally conversing in the living room. And it was a, it was a very old house. It was built before, you know, interior plumbing. So when they put in a restroom in the house, they had to add on to the house. And they put the restroom next to a very old well. And the well was actually still there. It was, it was an old stone well, and it was still exposed in their laundry room. The laundry room and restroom were next to each other, and they were on, on the left side of this house. And I, I guess I just needed to use the restroom and I just left everyone 
ended up using a restroom and on my way back passed by the laundry room with this well and in the well there was a ladder and it was somehow attached to the attic i don't exactly remember how that was in the room but i i specifically remember the well and i guess i i saw someone the beginning of it is very cloudy and a lot of this has been you know retold from what i told then you know a lot of the childhood encounters is your family retelling it saying hey do you remember that time when this happened and so through your older family members you're kind of able to remember a lot of this uh a lot of the encounters that happened when you were younger and i remember there being a man and I, I guess he, he called me into the room and I was slightly inside the doorway and he was fully physically there. And, you know, I, I wish I had a lot more of these details. I've thought about contacting, you know, a regressive hypnotherapist to help me see if I could figure out some more about this, but some of it is still extremely vivid, you know, almost 20 years later. So I remember he touches my shoulder and it it felt fully physical. There was, you know, there was matter there, solid matter touching my shoulder. And it was just like anyone else, you know, I'm four years old. My family, you know, I, I grew up in a religious, you know, Christian family in the South, not necessarily someone who's going to, talk about all these ghost stories, you know, plant that in my head at a young age. So I, I didn't know what a ghost was. Uh, th this man puts his hand on my shoulder and he kind of goes down to my level to talk to me. And the, uh, the details in his face are very vivid. He had this really unkept red hair and his nose for some reason was very red to the point that my four-year-old self thought he was a clown. He had red hair and a red nose. And I'm not sure if, you know, he was, I'm, I'm not sure to the extent of what, I don't know how I'm trying to say this. To me, the the easiest way to grasp how red his hair was and how red his nose was to, was to think he was a clown. You know, you, as a kid, you always try to relate what you see to what you know. And as a kid, you don't know everything yet. Like the, the story that came out recently where the kid was missing for like three days. And he said, well, a, a bear took care of me. And, you know, who knows what a bear to him could have been as a kid, you're used to seeing these cartoon bears, you know, that are very human-like, bipedal, Winnie the Pooh, you know, you're used to seeing things kind of like that. And, and a bear to him could mean anything. So, you know, I'm not exactly sure why, other than the color of his hair and the color of his nose, that I said clown. And he's talking to me. Now, I don't remember a thing he tells me, and I'm not even sure that I understood it. But everyone else is talking in the living room. My aunt happens to glance over and see me through the hallway, standing in this doorway, talking to this man. And there's no one else in in the house at the time. It, it's it's later at night. No one else in the house. And she says, "Christian, who are you talking to?" Because evidently I was I was saying things back to him. And I walk back into the living room. And I tell my aunt, the clown wants to talk to you. At that point, you know, her, <laughs> I'm sure she got extremely unsettled in that moment. Yeah. And she immediately gets her husband and says, we need to check the house. They check, don't see anyone there because, you know, if you're trying to grasp what a kid's telling you, if they say they're, they're talking to someone in the house, you're probably going to look around because, you know, you want to keep children safe around your house. You're going to look into that. Didn't see another person in the house, but her kids had always talked about noises. They had been in the house for a while 
I'm not sure if this was my first time in the house, but I know it was one of my first few times in the house. Her, her kids had reported things. I'm, I'm fairly certain they reported even a man. Uh, she didn't think much of it because children have active imaginations. She didn't think much of it, but they always had things go missing and they were always male items, you know, razors. Uh, they had shot glasses, like the, the tourism shot glasses you get that say something like Las Vegas or Niagara Falls on them. They like to collect those and decorate the kitchen with. They always had those go missing. And sometimes month, months later, they just find them, you know, in a random spot in the yard. And, you know, I don't think either of her kids during the entire time they lived there had experiences to that extent. But I had a second encounter that I remember much less of. Basically, she was she was babysitting me for a day. I was over. I believe it was just her and I. She was doing something else, and I was back in this laundry room. And there I was walking up to the attic. And she, uh, I know a lot less about this one, but she basically said, hey, what are you doing? And I said, oh, the man's up there. Uh, or the clown is up there and it sounds kind of like an imaginary friend or making something up. Uh, but they, they had a man pass away in the home before they owned it. And they basically bought it after he had passed away. And it was a brother and sister living next door. So his sister is still alive and she lives next door to her house. And she had photos of, of a group of men and one of them was the man that died in the house. And she ended up showing me these photos. I'm not sure if they were left in the house or if, you know, she somehow knew this man, knew a group that he was involved with, but she ended up showing me some photos and immediately, you know, I point at this man and say, that's the clown. But it was the man that passed away in the house. And to my knowledge, the the sister that still lives next door has never been told this story. You know, I I can't just walk up to someone and say, you know, I think I saw your brother's ghost 18, 19 years ago. Um, but th that was my first, I guess, spirit encounter, um, which kind of opened my family's eyes to a lot of things because at the time, you know, what I was talking about was extremely credible. Let's take a break and talk about a sponsor for today's show, which is Simply Safe. You know, in some states, the week after Christmas is the heaviest in crime for home burglaries. Cops are busy because people are breaking into homes, taking the gifts because people are traveling for the holidays. And not only that, we just came off Cyber Monday and you know that the porch pirates are following the UPS van, the FedEx van, the Amazon van. When they drop your gift on the porch, they come up behind, they take that gift. And what's crazy is that only one in five homes have home security, probably because most companies don't make it easy. There's long-term contracts with lots of hidden fees. The money that you have to pay on a monthly basis is out the roof. Other systems can be very difficult to install if you can even install it. A lot of times you have to have somebody professional come out and install it and actually know what they're doing and they're going to do a good job, you know? Simply Safe is just a good choice for a home security system. It's a good choice that I've been enjoying for a very long time now, and you should too. For the holidays, you get a huge discount on the system and you get a free security camera. Simply Safe protects every room, door, window, 24 7 professional monitoring. With Simply Safe, there is no contract, hidden fees, or fine print. Prices are fair and honest, starting at just $15 a month. Go to simplysafe.com slash confessionals now to take advantage of the Simply Safe amazing holiday savings and get a free HD security camera. This offer is for a limited time only and it's ending soon, so hurry. That's simplysafe.com slash confessionals to save big and get a free security camera. Simplysafe.com slash confessionals. Go and get yours today. The 
experience you had with this guy and he's di- he died in the, did, I'm, I'm assuming he died in the house right he didn't just live there and died yeah. somewhere um, do you think that there was a reason why you were seeing him and that he was trying to communicate with you Have, I mean you've had a long time to think about this and you don't remember what he was saying so do you think that he was trying to communicate something important to you or do you think maybe it was like residual energy where it was just reacting to you being there what are your thoughts on your experiences when it comes to how that all lays out uh, you know, I have no clue. That's part of reason that I wanted to work with uh, hypnotherapists and, and try to bring out some of these memories. I don't know how effective that would be. But I think when kids talk about encounters like that, especially when they talk about imaginary friends, you know, things like that, I think that needs to be taken seriously to a certain extent. Of course, kids have active imaginations and things like that. But uh, for some reason, my experience and my experience with my sister and all of that happened when I was very young. I'm not sure if kids have s- some ability or if they're targeted by spirits. You know, I I have no clue, but I think they're, they've got some ability that we somehow lose as adults. You know, I don't know if <laughs> people talk about third eye and everything you know, i i don't know but i as kids we just tend to have more experiences um yeah and so there's no telling what experience what experiences have happened in people's lives as children even you know the most hardened skeptics and they've just completely forgotten about it uh but you know i i don't know he was he was a Christian man, a member, a member of the church, and you know bo- both of the men I ended up seeing can be verified. You know to live here were believers in you know heaven, and it, it kind of influenced you know how I think about the afterlife and everything because it was right there in front of me. There's there's something there in front of me. So. It influenced on how you view the afterlife because you're sitting there, you're seeing something that's tangible right there in front of you. And, uh, you know, obviously that has its effects on people. Um, what did it do, though, that affected your thoughts? I mean, what are your thoughts on the afterlife that you draw conclusions from your experiences? Yeah. Uh, you know, I grew up in a Christian home and grew up in church, grew up learning everything. Even in college, I studied, uh, I studied the Bible in context. I studied, you know, all sorts of scriptural, uh, aspects of, of Christianity. And, you know, I, I remember being very young in a Sunday school class, not long after that encounter, maybe a few years after, and you know we were being taught the concept of heaven. It was like okay, when you're, when your um, relatives, friends, when everyone passes away, they wait for you in heaven, and you'll be reunited with them. You know when you pass away. And my family's always joked about me about my first word being actually because you know I was so big on <laughs> knowing all these facts and correcting everyone with yeah. everything. <laughs> wrong but i ended up you know telling the sunday school teacher i was like no i they're they're here on earth and a part of that was you know i, I did see a relative and i guess i'll talk about that next but i, I said no like i've i've seen him here on earth and they're like what are you talking about i i, I couldn't have been older than you know six or seven at that time so they're like okay you've got an active imagination and you know <laughs> you don't want to be spreading all this and, you know, a conservative Sunday school group. But yeah, to me, I, you know, I didn't know what to think anymore. I, I still believe in, you know, heaven and hell, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah, I agree with you, man. And it's funny because, you know, the Sunday school teacher was probably just thinking, silly kid, he doesn't know what real reality is. He just, you know, watched too many movies or this, that, and the other. And uh, that's really the general conclusion you're going to get from a Sunday school teacher typically. Um, most of the time, leaderships, uh, leadership of these organizations, they, they don't believe that 
you know, people, the ghosts that people are seeing are actual ghosts. If, if you're seeing anything, they just say it's all demonic and evil. And, uh, it's impossible that your grandfather, um, or anybody would be, you know, have any ability to communicate with you or anything like that. And, uh, I've, you know, I sound like a broken record, but I don't care. Um, it, it's just not, that's just not a biblical point of view in my mind. Um, and there's, an, there's Old Testament writings in the Bible that point to different conclusions and what they're teaching. And so, you know, I'm not saying that everything is, you know, a relative and, uh, nothing is demonic. I think a lot of things are demonic, but, uh, I don't think every situation people have is a demonic situation because, uh, well, I just don't think the Bible says that. And so, um, but it makes people uncomfortable to go down that road when it comes to their faith. So, uh, I, in, in a sense, I can understand just because the comfort level there and stuff, but at the same time, if you're in leadership and you're teaching other people, um, staying away from the stuff that it's hard to understand isn't necessarily the right thing to do. You know what I mean? Yeah. So why don't you talk to us about the experience you had where I think it was you and your sister saw your grandfather after he passed away, right? Yes. Uh, that was in a car, actually. Um, my father, you know, he's a scuba diver. He had a, he had a dive shop about you know, 30 or 40 minutes from where we had lived at the time. My sister was very young. I just learned to talk you know she just started talking and i was a bit older than her but still young enough you know to not understand everything uh and and to try to young enough to try to put things into make them fit into my own world perspective so we were driving home and i believe i said in the interview that my father was in the car that's incorrect he was actually in the car in front of us. Uh, but I remember him being there. That's because he pulled over in front of us. Uh, and I, I want to get all that correct, but we were driving home. We were following my dad from the dive shop back home. And my sister starts crying. You know, she's absolutely bawling in the back seat. She's still in this car seat and she's just, you know, screaming. And, you know, my sister didn't really have a reason to be crying. My, my mom, she's, uh, she has a background in, you know, CPR, first aid, you know, medical profession. And her first thought is when a child is crying like that, you know, it could mean choking or something severe is wrong. So she kept pulling the car over, checking on my sister, and then my sister would stop crying. But, you know, we'd start driving again she'd start absolutely screaming at the top of her lungs again. And uh, my mom kept saying, she's like, Hey, what's, what's wrong with your sister? Uh, and she's asking her directly, she said, what's, what's wrong. And my sister kept saying the man, well, she would have been too young at the time to have any memories of, of my grandfather. And the same one that was, you know, the, the same one that was instrumental in, in project high jump. And she kept saying that. Well, I, I didn't see anything, but she kept saying the man. And then somehow, yeah, I don't remember if it was full body. I just remember the upper body. My grandfather, and I don't remember how old he was, which is weird, but I remember it somehow just knowing that it was my grandfather. Uh, I don't know if it was the age he died or if he was much younger, but somehow in my mind, I just knew it was him, but he reached for her hand in that car seat. We were separated. I was on the right. She was on the left. And in between us, there he was just sitting there and he had tried to hold her hand. And, you know, my mom now largely because of this experience, but she's had some others. She's a huge believer in this idea of, you know, guardian angels. And my mom, just, you know, it slams on the brakes, pulls the car over. She didn't see anything. 
it was what we told her, but it was like a split second thing. And then my dad sees that we pull over in his rear view mirror, and he, you know, he just slams on the brakes and and pulls up beside us, uh, or in front of us, and gets out of the car because to him, you know, seeing us pull over like that, something has to be incredibly wrong. And but my mom's just screaming. She's like, "What's wrong with your sister?" And I said, "Grandpa tried to hold her hand." Well, this was months after my mom's dad had passed away. And, you know, to her, that was probably pretty shocking to hear. But, but both of us were saying, that, like, yeah, this man was back here trying to hold her hand. And my father, who was, you know, even after my first encounter, all that happened in the house, he was not in any way, like, a believer in, in spiritual things. And, you know, this event kind of changed that but here he was a skeptic at the time hearing us say that my mom's recently deceased grandfather just tried to hold my sister's hand and we're over on you know the side of a highway and he's just screaming into the air because this is one of his kids is crying he's screaming into the air at you know my mom's deceased father saying things like stay away from my kids uh, like they, you're scaring them, and so this obviously had to be <laughs> pretty traumatic for a, a family to experience. You know, one of my mom's parents just showing up in the back seat, even though they'd passed on. My dad, being a skeptic, yet having this much aggression at the moment, uh, and you know, I I don't know how you're supposed to feel when. Um, your husband yells for your deceased dad to, you know, stay away from your kids. That's probably a pretty strange moment, but it, there was so much, you know, emotion in that moment. And I, I don't remember that one quite as much as the first one. Part of it is that my family, you know, we just didn't talk about it much after that. It, it was years in between every time. And my mom, when she was alone with us, would say, hey, like, I want you to remember that this happened. It, all of my siblings, you know, after he passed away, we'd end up. Her thing, her thing was that they'd find pennies throughout their houses, heads up. That, that was like a good luck to them. But when he was alive, when they were all still, you know, under one roof uh, as teenagers and things like that, that's what he would do to, you know, kind of leave messages to them in the house. And and they still had that happen. And, you know, a lot of that can be explained, but it would be in, you know, very strange places. And they'd be like, okay, that's funny. Like, dad's still here. But yeah, in, in short, that's that's my second encounter. Yeah, that's really interesting, man. Now, uh, to this day, I guess your dad is now a believer in paranormal because of that experience? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. There's, there's a third one, which both of my parents experienced, I was kind of separate from it. It's, it's what my parents experienced at the time that I didn't even mention in the email, but they called out an angel encounter. They had an angel encounter. Yeah. I'll, I'll try to touch upon that really quickly. Okay. Um, but my father, after that, a few years after that second incident, he ended up getting a brain tumor. Uh, specifically he had been diagnosed with acromegaly, which is extremely rare. And it's basically when things like tumors cause the pituitary gland to continuously produce growth hormone throughout your entire life. So even after, you know, he had, he should have been well past growth as as a human, uh, he was still growing. So he was, you know, I believe he had gained like six or seven inches within like a year or two of my parents getting married and it's, it's caused a lot of, you know, joint issues in his body, but essentially it's a brain tumor, very rare and affects the body physically with, with growth. And it's been theorized that maybe that's what Goliath of the Bible had. Uh, but it's one of those extremely rare things. So, 
my parents were very worried at the time. He had recently gotten diagnosed and they had been to, my mom recently told me this, it was 21 or 22 doctors and they had the diagnosis, but no one really knew how to operate. He kept getting responses like, you know, we're going to have to try something extremely experimental. You know, we want you to be the first person to undergo this surgery, have, you know, all these TV shows, books, documentaries about your case specifically, because, you know, they, no one has had seen anything like it, but they were traveling, you know, all over the country trying to get answers from all these doctors. And then they get to, I, I guess it, it was like the 23rd or something like that, but he was a Christian doctor and he had, you know, crosses and verses in his office, I guess. And my mom just felt comforted by that. And by all means, if a doctor is not of your faith, please trust them. They're educated enough to be trusted. But <laughs> to a family that grew up Christian, you know, that was just comforting to see. And he uh, he said, okay, pull the kids out of school for a few weeks. And my sister and I were... Uh, she's a few younger than I was, but I was in, I think, second or third grade at the time. And she said, pull the kids out. Or he, he said, pull the kids out of school. Go take a mini vacation. My mom had all these medical records, all the exams they had done, all the, uh, you know, the tests run. She had all that, hundreds, if not thousands of pages of, of medical records. And he said, let me take this. Let me study these for a few weeks go take a mini vacation with the kids. And then when you come back, I'll have everything prepped. You know, we're, we're going to be ready to do this. And it, we, you know, we're kind of um, diving family. Both my parents were scuba divers. My dad had the dive shop. They spent time as you know, like Caribbean dive guides. So, you know, we spent all of our time around the water. So naturally we go to, uh, the coast and in Texas, you know, one of the main coastal towns is, is Galveston. So we went to that area, uh, for a few weeks and, and we stayed there for a bit and, you know, I'm sure my parents were super worried because my dad, it was kind of like 50, 50 going into the surgery on, you know, if it was even going to be successful or not, um, or if he was even going to survive the surgery. But, you know, we didn't know that at the time. We just saw it as, you know, just being pulled out of school for a few weeks to to enjoy the coast. And we go out to eat. And they used to do all sorts of rig dives on the coast and everything. So we were familiar with some of the smaller towns around Galveston, further west. And we ended up going to, I believe, the town of Surfside Beach. I might be incorrect about that. But. Surfside Beach, and we end up asking locals, like, what's the best place to eat around here? And they tell us this burger shack, and it was named the Jetty or the Jetty, something like that. But it was this wooden shack basically on the beach. Uh, and there's one strip of road where you could see cars coming in and leaving. Well, and there weren't many people there when when we got there because we went during the week, you know, not many tourists in the area, just whoever was, whoever was around. And my parents were kind of sitting at the bar and then looking out, you could see, see the water, see the cars coming in and leaving. So you could obviously see who was headed to the restaurant and who was leaving. And we were one of the few people there. We were kind of separate from my parents at the time, I'm not sure if we were, you know, playing with our dog or whatever it was, but, and I don't have any recollection of this at all. It was just what, what my mother has retold, but a man, nothing strange in appearance about him. I mean, he was bald at a normal shirt on normally dressed, but he, he walks up and he says, you have acromegaly to my dad. My parents are, are sort of shocked. You're like, what? Yeah. I do have acromegaly and the guy, he was 
short so and not large and so that was obviously not a sign of acromegaly so you know why would he know anything about acromegaly and he says it was like he knew their situation exactly he said you have not been tested in this way when you go back home you need to request to have this test done uh you need to have them look at this you need to have them scan you know your brain in this way you need to have them check for you know this chemical and have them do the surgery in this way and you know, I, my mom would know exactly what he told them, but I don't remember a lot of those questions that she talked about. But at the time, they were like, how How do you know all this? Like, you obviously somehow know exactly what we're going through, that we were sent away. And it was some guy acting like he was just at the restaurant. And then he doesn't even give a name. He walks into the bathroom and, and there's no other exit in the bathroom. He walks into the bathroom. My dad said we didn't get his name and he walks into the bathroom and he's not there. So they start frantically checking the beach at that one road, seeing if any cars were coming in or out and there was nothing there. And they asked, you know, people in the restaurant, did you see this guy? And, and they said, no, like <laughs> we have no clue who you're talking about. And in that moment, they said, like, there's no other explanation right now other than that was someone sent to, you know, significantly change the scenario and point us in the right direction. When he got back, he ended up saying everything they were told to that doctor and it, you know, impacted everything to the point of they changed how they did surgery and how much, you know, of, of everything was removed. And basically, they see his life being saved by that random stranger because they don't think the surgery is done how they had wanted to do it originally. They don't think that would have been successful or survivable. And to them, at the moment, they just agree that, yeah, like <laughs> that might have been an angel. Um, you know, I, I just heard that story for the first time recently after I originally emailed you, but I was like, wow, that's, that's an incredible story. All right, let's talk about our last sponsor for today's show, which is Audible. It's that time of year we're buying gifts for family members and Audible is a great gift for somebody that you love or you can gift it to yourself because it's a great offer that we're offering right now with Audible. Now is the best time to do it. I'm telling you guys with a special offer that they're offering a 53% off your first three months. 53% off your first three months. That's a quarter of the year at 53% off. That is a great deal. Access an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, motivation, mysteries, thrillers, memoirs, and more. You can choose three titles every month, one audiobook, and two exclusive Audible originals. You can't hear these anywhere else. You can listen on any device, anytime, anywhere with the Audible app. It's great while commuting, at the gym, or during your holiday travels. We're all traveling for the holiday, and sometimes to pass the three-hour drive, you got to go to Aunt Susie's house because mom and dad are making you go. Listen to an audiobook with Audible. And right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half of the regular price. Give yourself the gift of listening for more. Go to audible.com slash confessionals right now for a limited time. You can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half of the regular price. Choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Visit audible.com slash confessionals or text confessionals to 500-500. And right now, I am actually using audible to listen to the unseen realm by dr michael s heiser you guys have heard me talk about him on the show before i absolutely love michael heiser's work and the unseen realm is one of the best that i have ever sunk my teeth into or my ears 
The Unseen Realm. Definitely check it out if you're interested in finding out what a Bible scholar thinks of what is on the other side. I find it very interesting that your family just seems to have a very um, commonality with the unusual, whether you want to call it paranormal, supernatural, whatever it is. Uh, it just, it really seems to gravitate to, to you guys. And uh, that's really interesting, man. Yeah. So why don't you talk to us about these Bigfoot pictures? Now, uh, you saw these Bigfoot pictures from, I guess, uh, somebody that you know, whether it's a family friend or something. Uh, and was that before or after you had your own experience with, you know, what sounded like a bunch of chimpanzees yelling? That was before. Okay. Uh, and this was, I, I had a huge interest in cryptozoology. You know, I had, I had those, uh, those paranormal encounters, but, you know, it wasn't until high school that I had any interest in the paranormal. You know, I, I, I had those encounters, and I was satisfied with knowing that there's some things we don't know. I, I wasn't dying to have answers. I was just satisfied knowing that, hey, you might end up seeing a relative again, but I, I don't know how to explain it, but I had that. And then the Sasquatch phenomena had been the complete opposite. Uh, my father said he was a diver, and when I was very young, you know, my first big interest was in paleontology. And so when those mix, I'm obviously going to have a huge interest in lake monster and, and marine reptile sightings. Uh, so we got our interest in cryptozoology from that. It was initially all marine reptiles. I didn't care at all about Bigfoot. I don't even know if I knew much about Bigfoot at the time, but anytime a show was on about you know, Lake Champlain or, or Loch Ness, we would watch it. And, and one of these shows was a kind of a mashup of, of all things mysterious and Nessie was in it. So, so we watched it, but this one show gave me my experience into Bigfoot and it showed that, that Patterson Gimlin film and so many people across so many generations have that as their first Bigfoot experience. And at the time I was like, okay, that's kind of cool, but you know, it's just some sort of ape in the woods on the West coast. I live in Texas. It doesn't concern me at all. I'm still really interested in, in these, in these lake monsters. But my dad, having a kinesiology background, always looked at it and said, you know, it's, it's kind of walking funny. And now, looking in depth at it, I think the film is pretty indicative of a mid-tarsal break when you look at, you know, how the heel rotates. Uh, but yeah, that was my first experience into to this Sasquatch phenomenon. And... Didn't think it concerned me, but I, I was still, you know, kind of kind of interested in it, but it was a West Coast problem. Well, one day, my mom ended up talking with a friend of hers about me, and when my mom talked about me, you know, my big interest was, was cryptozoology and paleontology. Well, she ended up telling this friend that I was very interested in cryptozoology and, and you know trying to discover these new animals and, and things like that. And this family friend was like, huh, why, why don't you guys come out to my property and we can spotlight for them? That's what she called it. And, you know, we thought, we thought she was crazy. None of us had any much belief in it at the time. My, my mom had some classmates that had some big encounters when she was in high school that were a pretty big deal, but you know, None of us thought much about Sasquatch in, in East Texas. And she invites us to, to come out and look for them. And her property was on the border of Fairchild State Forest in Maydell, Texas. And it was very remote uh, for this area. You know, East Texas, it's a bunch of towns separated by 20 or 30 miles. And in between, it's it's 
generally nothing but hunting leases and properties with a ton of wildlife, a ton of woods, you know, really, really good spot if something like that wanted to hide. But at the time, we, we weren't expecting anything. So we go out, and this was the summer, I believe, June of 2008. And we've got one spotlight, and we drive out to a property. And she was like, okay, load up in the back of the truck. She had this old truck. She lived alone. I don't remember much about the house. I believe it may have been a trailer, actually, on the property that she lived in. Uh, but she's like, okay, load up in the truck. We'll drive out there. So we drove through so many fields. It was like 20 extra minutes of driving just to get to, to this last field. And she had, she had loaded up all these weapons in the back and, uh, you know, she threw rifles back there, machetes back there. And we were just kind of joking on the way back there. I was, 12 years old and I was like this is kind of funny this woman's crazy and she's like okay here we are and we get out and we're in like hip high grass and we're surrounded on three sides by tree line and the closest point is you know it can't be more than you know 30 or 40 feet away from this tree line here we are in this field and she's like, okay, just wait. I'm hoping they'll still be out because you're new. And at this time, we were still thinking this woman's crazy. Well, after a few minutes, these uh, lights of some sort, the best description I've ever had or I've ever thought of for something like this is if someone turns on, you know, like an LED watch that you could get for cheap one of those backlit led watches from like 40 or 50 feet away at night that's that's what the light looked like and that popped up and then she said okay there's one and we're like okay that's you know kind of weird but it's probably eye shine or something and it was about six to seven feet up and my dad is about six and a half feet tall so I, I had a pretty good, even at that, you know, pretty good, you know, awareness of, of how high this thing was, was up compared to the trees. And then another one would pop up and it would be on the other side of, you know, like on the other side of this tree line. And they were never together, always in different areas. And it, it very, a lot of people talk about bright lights. These were very, very dim. There was a little bit of moonlight, but not much. And they were extremely dim. And, you know, there were four or five pop up. And she says, they close close their eyes if you shine the light at them. Well, she turned on the spotlight and named it directly at one. And there was nothing there. You know, you'd think that at, at the time when I was thinking it was, you know, a raccoon in a tree or something like that you would have seen something or heard it scuttle away down the tree. And there was simply nothing there. And, you know, she talked about it. Like there was a few, I honestly think this is a pretty definite class B encounter that night. I I wouldn't know how else to describe it. There was no smell, no sound. And occasionally, you know, this could have easily been the mind playing trick. The the lights were definite, but you'd almost swear that you'd see movement in between trees. And it was so quick, like jumping between tree and they'd be, you know, 12 to 15 feet away from each other. And you'd swear that, you know, that tree just moved. You didn't know what was a tree and what wasn't a tree. And it, it, it was very creepy that night, but still we were like, okay, to someone who's never studied this, never looked into it, they kind of expect, you know, these things to kind of walk out of the woods and wave at you. And that's not what happens. But my mom, you know, 10 years, almost 11 years removed from this, 
we, we had lunch the other day and I said, Hey, do you remember anything about that? We had not really talked about that night since then. And I asked if she remembered anything and she said, yeah, I saw one stand up in the grass out of the corner of my eye. And she's like, I'll swear on it. I, I didn't know what to think about it. I ended up getting so scared in that field that I kind of convinced myself that it was a, like a tree that had cracked halfway up, something like that. And, but then she's like, that doesn't make sense. It was a hay field. Why would there be a tree stump in the middle of this field? And I, I didn't notice it when, when I was there, but she swears out of the corner of her eyes, she saw it stand up. Well, a few weeks after this, we, we go home that night. Nothing happens. We don't really talk much. We're like, okay, that was kind of cool, kind of weird. We didn't see anything as new <laughs> investigators, if you want to say. We were kind of disappointed. We're like, okay, we expected these things to just walk out of the woods. and not us to be able to just <laughs> look at them. But we get back in the truck, we end up driving home uh, and didn't really say much about it. Like, okay, that was that was kind of a funny experience. But looking back, knowing what I know now, I think that was like all the signs of the typical Class B encounter. Well, a few weeks after this, she noticed that, that you, know, I, you know, I was kind of having some fun that night and she was like, you know, I I remember she said this. She said, I don't want to scare you, but I want you to know what's out there. And she told me what she knew. And she had known a lot, which makes me think that there are a lot of people out there who just don't have an interest in coming forward with anything or, you know, don't know how to. They don't know about, you know, these platforms that are around that they can use to, to talk about it or she she had no interest in telling anyone because she was afraid that people would come on her property and she had you know developed a relationship with these things where she was scared that, that they would leave or leave or something like that but she ended up telling me she said there's a family of four maybe five on my property and I can tell them apart in the face and they have slightly different hair color but it's the facial features that makes them definitely discernible and at the time i was like what you know (laughs) at 12 years old my idea was a species was that you know they all look the same but us humans are the exact opposite uh she talked a little bit about the behavior she talked about hand signs didn't say anything about spoken language that I remember. And I know that's a big thing that they're researching now, but she talked all about hand signs. And she says, when they hunt, usually it's one that hunts, but they end up doing all these crazy, you know, trap setups and everything, not, not, you know, physical traps, but, you know, they try to corner something like a, like an intelligent human would, but she said they, uh, talk with hand signs um another thing she said was that she thinks they bury their dead and at the time i'm like this woman is absolutely crazy you know in all the the, no one talks about any of this in the shows that were around on you know bbc uh, all the you know national geographic documentaries on it you know they don't talk about anything they talk about you know just some sort of gorilla that lives in the west but is larger and that's what i thought it was but she said no they they're close to us they they teach their young or they care for their young a lot like we do and she described the family structure to me and she talked about two adults she thought it was you know like a male and a female kind of like a typical family structure she talked about two little ones and she said i live alone and you know it's over years of living here, they've kind of been okay with me. I, I don't hurt them. I always carry a weapon, but I don't hurt them. She talked about going out on horseback very often, and she'd walk around the property often as well, but if she ever smelled what she described as lemon Windex, she knew they were around. And that's the big argument now. It's, is it scent gland or is it, you know, just they smell bad? 
I don't know, but she always talked about Lemon Windex. Didn't say anything about vocalizations or anything like that. She, the smell was the main part of, of what she talked about. And, you know, at this time I was like, this is all this information is crazy. And I'm sure I asked questions like, you know, how do they do this or that? And she didn't know a lot of it, but she said, yeah, this is what I've been able to see. They like to leave things on my porch. She always had rocks or dead animals, you know, end up on the porch. And that was crazy to me. That was the first time I heard that. And so, you know, honestly, for years, I didn't think much about what she said to me until I found out that so many people were coming forward with reports, specifically through things like Sasquatch Chronicles. And I found out about the BFRO, looking through these reports of all the behaviors. And I was like, okay, everything this woman said is, you know, is reported elsewhere. And the the main thing that that I'm I'll talk about in this encounter is the photos. She gives me all these CDs, and you know, just simple rewritable CDs. And she said she had a digital camera, and she always tried to take photos if she knew they were around or if they were you know showing themselves. And she said. Yeah, look through this if you want to see what they look like. Well, at 12 years old, with my young scientific mind, I, you know, I, obviously I'm going to be like, yeah, I really want to see what these things look like. So she gives me the CDs, and I head home. I think I, I met her with my mom after she was off work or something like that. But she gives me the CDs, and then we drive home, and it's a few days before I actually get around to looking at what's on it. And I'm still kind of at that time thinking that this woman is absolutely crazy. It's like Bigfoot is not in Texas. That's in Washington. And I don't believe much of what she even says, even as, you know, a very gullible 12 year old. And I start, I, I pop in the first CD into a really old MacBook, and I kind of look at see what folders are there. Nothing was labeled, but it was kind of labeled by date. You know, here are the photos I took on this day. It was labeled by date, or a few were labeled by month. I remember that, and. There's no telling how many photos would have been on all of these or if this was everything she had. But I look at the first few photos and, you know, I'm not, I'm not seeing a whole lot. It was, she took them in the woods and it was kind of a, not exactly a very high quality camera. It was, it was okay. Um, enough to, to, to see things that are pretty good. But, you know, when you're in a very, low contrast area like in east texas woods and you just take a photo you know it, it might not be the best way to to see what's there but the it was like the fourth or fifth photo was taken from the field and it was taken of this bush and, I, and at the time i was like okay this is <laughs> why is she taking a photo of this bush it's just a bush right in front of her and then I see the shoulders and I'm like, okay, is that something standing there? There there were, you know, kind of impressions of forms behind trees in the other photos. It was kind of like tree peeking, but you couldn't really see anything that was, that was going on. It was like something weird is behind that tree or that's a very strange shadow shape behind this bush. And I, it, it wasn't really showing much, but one of the first photos I came across had these this shoulder outline behind it and i follow it up and i see the face and that at that time in my entire life that might be the moment that scared me the most i i don't know of any other time i've felt like that in my entire life and i'm just seeing this photo and i'm sitting in my room and I'm like, okay, 
am I really seeing this? Look over it, zoom in, and it, it, it kind of scares me so much that I end up closing the photo immediately and closing my laptop. I didn't even look through the rest of the photos, and I really regret that now, but at 12 years old, I was so scared. I didn't want to know anything else ended up giving the photos back to her, not mentioning that I saw anything in the photos until, you know, like years later. And when I finally, it was probably college when I finally said I had seen stuff in the photos because it impacted me so much. And I was young. It didn't necessarily scare me out of the woods, but it was something that was always on my mind. I was like, what if, because I had spent enough time to know in the woods to know that you know, there's not one everywhere, but I was like, okay, that I don't know what that is, but it's in this area, and it really impacted the way I think about you know this area at that time. And the face is the thing that really got me, and I can describe that really well because it's really vivid, and. I ended up actually studying physical anthropology in college. Uh, took quite a few courses in that, and some things started to make sense about what I saw. But this first face, I think it was, to me, it was obviously male. It might have been that it was just so grotesque I couldn't see a female face being like that. But it had a lot of, you know, the traditional markings that people talk about today when they talk about faces that they see. And the the big thing was the eyes, how sunken the eyes were. The, the closest representation I've ever seen to the eyes is if you've ever seen the movie Sinister, there's the character of, you know, Mr. Boogie, how sunken his eyes are. The, the shape is kind of similar what's big is that it's hard to tell the the shadows that it creates. It's so hard to tell where the, the eye actually starts and where, you know, where anything is within those two eye sockets. Uh, to me, it looked like it would have had his eyes open. I just couldn't see any pupils or anything like that. I'm not sure if the, the contrast was so high that you couldn't see anything through that, that shadow. Or if, you know, that portion of the eye was black. And I'll talk about another photo that the, the eye was different. But in this eye, it was it, it looked like it was fully black. The brow line was the thing that stuck out the most about the top of the head. Uh, very, very sharp. Uh, almost like, again, I, I studied physical anthropology ended up looking at all of these, you know, pre human species. And it reminded me a lot of that. I I didn't know how common that was in in early humans with the, the very, you know, pointed, pointed brow line. Uh, I thought the sagittal crest was pretty obvious. There was no hair on the face except for the cheeks, but not on the chin. It was, it reminded me almost of, uh, uh, what are they called? Like mutton chops, but they were not thick. Uh, but it was obvious hair there. I'm not sure what the skin would have been like underneath. I couldn't even see the bottom of the chin. That was covered behind a leaf. Uh, and another thing that was super obvious about this was how drastically different the zygomatic process or the the cheekbones were from ours in, in humans, the temple and and the cheekbones are somewhat level, uh, vertically, but in theirs, it it was, you know, in at least like two inches further wide than, than the temple. Uh, the forehead was a bit different. It had, uh, I think it said in the email that, um, I don't remember the character's name, but from Star Trek, he has the, the folds in the forehead. I'm not sure if it was, age or or what but it it had lines on the side of the forehead um not super obvious but it was 
it was like it was very wrinkly or old, something like that. The side of the forehead had these wrinkles. Uh, couldn't see the top of the forehead, but the majority from you know middle of the forehead to uh, just below the bottom lip was perfectly exposed through this bush. And you know, I I understand why people describe it as the boogeyman. It, it was so grotesque to me. You know, I it it felt like un, unnatural. That's the only way I know how to describe it right now. Um, it it kind of burned that image in my mind. Where I, I could still, you know, retell a lot of the image, retell a lot of what the image looked like today, even though I'm years removed from it. Uh, and the way it was standing was kind of strange. It was not all visible from behind the bush, but you can make out a lot of the shape. And it was pretty obvious. It was bent over with the hands on the knees. Uh, like imagine NFL linebacker, like Ray Lewis pre-snap bent over hands on his knees. And it, the face is just pointing to this bush. And the whole time I was like, he's standing in a bush. Like, why is he standing in a bush? That, that makes no sense to me. And I realized how close she was. I was like, surely she saw this face. Well, I'm not sure she did. She may have heard something, but you know, I, if she saw something that close, I'm not sure why she's taking the photo. Um, and it was just leaned over staring at her. And I, it was so well camouflaged that you can probably be within a few feet, stare at this bush for seconds before you realize that something's there. But if not for, you know, the, the outline of that shadow of the shoulders that I, I would have even seen it. And there's no telling if, if the first few photos even had anything and they very well might have. Uh, but it didn't make sense to me until I got, you know, back into researching Sasquatch. I, you know, I didn't have much of an interest. I, I kind of had an interest in high school. But I was busy with so many other things. Um, and then, you know, in college, I kind of got interested in, in Sasquatch again. And I found out about Sasquatch Chronicles. I was listening to this one episode actually set in Palestine, Texas, which is maybe 30 minutes from here. And very close to the spot where I actually had that encounter in this guy described seeing the thing poke its face through the bush and i believe kind of grin at him or something like that and then i was like okay someone else has seen this thing stick its face out through the bush not you know a walk out in between trees or whatever they call tree peeking kind of leaning over this thing had stuck its face through the bush and it was standing inside of of the bush and even after that, I was like, okay, I can probably figure out, uh, figure out how tall this thing could have been. Didn't notice anything about muscle, but I was like, I, I know what camera she used or, or generally what kind of camera she used. I remember exactly where it was in the photo. And I remember, you know, where the eyes were kind of how far above the forehead uh, or above the forehead was. So I did some measurements. I was like, okay, I got my dad to help me figure this out. I'm about six feet tall. And if I lean over in that exact position, I lose about a third of my height. Well, I remember hers was about right in the middle of that right quadrant of the photo. And part of the reason I think that she didn't exactly know it was there. She, she kind of randomly took the photo was that this thing was not centered at all. It was kind of in, in the corner of this photo. But from what you could see of, of the ground in front and the, the, you know, the level of the bush, it was fairly level. She took it, you know, with the horizon. So from that, I was like, okay, I think she was about this far away and it was about here in the quadrant. And I ended up measuring it. And I estimate she would have, you know, held the camera around her chest or her chin taking this photo. So I did all these measurements 
and I said, uh, I believe I ended up coming up with this thing. If it was standing straight up, would have been about eight feet. If it was indeed leaning over on its knees, um, and I, I have those exact measurements somewhere, but I, it was between like eight and eight and a half feet. If it was standing up and if it was similar to us, but that was so impactful to me, that photo that I didn't look at any other photos until <laughs> college. I had actually downloaded one other photo and it was, uh, it was not in a folder and that's why I downloaded it. But I never looked at that one, and it was always on that hard drive for years. And ended up looking back at it in college. And kind of didn't forget about that encounter, but, you know, I I didn't talk about it much. And then I see that photo, and I'm like, okay, I remember this is from when the lady showed me, or let me borrow all those photos. And there was a, a second eye in that one. And I remember sitting in my apartment on the couch and seeing this eye. And I was like, Oh God, here's another face. And that, that kind of feeling came back, but it, it wasn't nearly as scary this time. And the, the eye on that photo, and I still have the photo, uh, somewhere on that old hard drive. Uh, and I'm sure that's still accessible but the eye was so big and it was like you couldn't tell much details about the face but you could see the eye kind of behind some foliage and a few things really bothered me about it and I remember it being with that group of Sasquatch photos so I I generally or I I immediately associated it with Sasquatch but the, the thing I got from that one was that it was completely different from the other one. Like the, the face of the eye was completely different. It reminded me a lot of a tiger because the, the outline of the eye was black. Tigers have that, you know, black skin around the eye. And the second reason it reminded me of a tiger was because in this one, uh, it was, it was about her head level, uh, with the photo. But in this one, the eye was yellow and the, uh, I specifically remember the horizontal slit of the pupil, or, uh, sorry, the vertical slit of the pupil. And that, I didn't know what I was looking at. I was like, is this a, is this a tiger? Uh, it, it wasn't orange or anything like that, but I specifically remember the, the slit pupil. And I was like, I have no clue what this was. I thought, they have eyes like us and there have been a few other rare encounters talking about the slit pupils. Well, it, it makes sense. And I ended up reaching out to a few people about this. And I said, if there's one thing I, I know about Sasquatch is that the, the pupil is, is exactly how I saw it in that photo with the slit or I don't know if it's, if it's gender difference with, with the males having the wider pupils and the females having slits. That really doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but it made sense uh, talking to a few people um, about the, the pupils. I was told that that's pretty indicative of ambush hunting at night and during the day when that exact photo was taken. Uh, that's how they would have to you know restrict sunlight. Uh, and I'm not even sure if I mentioned that second photo in the, in the email, but that was pretty recent. That was, you know, five years ago, maybe. And ended up showing one roommate and I was like, Hey, what do you see in this photo? And he's like, that's, that's definitely an eye. I have no clue what that is though. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's, I, I don't often associate that with my first photo because I'm not sure what it is. Uh, but unless it's some sort of feline standing up, I have no clue, but those are the two photos that, that really impacted me. Yeah, man. I, I, they would impact, I think anybody. And, uh, do you, so you still have this hard drive, right? Yeah. It's on an old, uh, old MacBook hard drive and an external hard drive. Um, 
SAT hard drive, the external one, I still have. I'm not sure if you know it's even available to be recovered still. I must. I'm. I hope it's still in working condition. Uh, but you know, I haven't looked. It was just that one photo in there, and you know, I I didn't have an explanation for that eye. But wow. I'm pretty sure I still have that photo, and it's in you know recoverable condition. How many pictures do you have? Uh, just that one photo on that hard drive. I only looked at, you know, like the first four and the four or five photos in the, that first folder and then the one that was outside. And then I downloaded the one onto that external hard drive that was not in any other folders, but it was on that first CD and it didn't even look on that external hard drive until college until i started using it for like college projects and it, it, suddenly everything came back then and i was like okay this is one that the woman sent to me and i i remember there being an eye and you know i'm very certain that it, it is indeed an eye but the thing that bothered me is that the pupil yeah man i i, I think it would be really cool to see some of these pictures that you have yeah and i've been collecting a few uh reports locally as well uh i think i have a really good one from you know around that exact area um and i can tell that you know i think that's a really good report if you want to hear it uh yeah go ahead uh okay uh well since i've you know kind of accidentally stumbled into this i've been obsessed with uh figuring out you know everything i can and i think the the first thing that you need to look at is reports you know i i didn't expect to to come on to the show to talk about anything but i sent you w- my experiences because you know i consider you someone who has all these reports and you probably know more than than most people just because of the you know the vast amount of, of encounters you hear from people uh but I've really enjoyed tracking down some of these lesson and reports. Like I said, a lot of people it, it's kept within the family or no one knows how to come out with it. But my mother was, uh, she recently met up with, with another friend who recently came back to the United States and they went to high school together. And she started talking about, you know, some of the stuff that I was doing and, and Bigfoot came up, uh, as one of the subjects of their discussion. And, this guy says, oh yeah, my, my grandfather had an encounter that he talked about, you know, until, until the day he died and he swore by it. And I think it's very credible because of not only who it's from, uh, if you knew the guy, he's very credible and, you know, he wasn't, he wouldn't just make up things that, his grandfather uh, make up stories for his grandfather and you know, he's, he's very professional and another is the time period that it took place in this encounter was from the late 1930s and that's decades before, you know, all this stuff ended up coming out and, you know, he wasn't influenced by the Patterson Gimlin film or anything like that. So he, according to his grandfather, was coon hunting in Reclaw, Texas in the late 1930s. And he ended up finding what he described as two dead baby monkeys in the woods. And that's a very strange thing to to talk about. Another thing that I've kind of said throughout some of these encounters is that you generally try to relate reports to whatever your worldview is. Well, if Sasquatch or a Bigfoot, you know, isn't something that's, that's commonly talked about in the area. If you, if you do see, you know, some sort of adolescent that's dead in the woods, you're probably going to call it a monkey. That's something that you're familiar with. And he said there were two dead baby monkeys laying in, you know, in some pine needles in this woods on, on a coon hunting property in Reclaw, Texas. But the way he described 
the condition kind of it made something click for me. And he said, well, one, the head was missing. It was like the, the head had been you know, twisted and pulled right off. And the other one was in perfect condition. We didn't know how that died. And it wasn't until decades later that he realized you know, what he saw. Uh, it, but he, he always talked about that story until the day he died. And it kind of clicked for me because there are so many reports out there of deer or dogs, whatever it is, with the head just missing. And a lot of people theorize, you know, that's how they, they kill prey. They quickly kill prey. And I was like, okay, well, through studying primatology and everything that I've looked into, you know, I, I know a lot of these ape species can be very territorial. Um, or they can exhibit behaviors that would, you know, kind of explain this. And so in my mind, when he told me that, I immediately thought, okay, this was a territorial killing. Now, it's very, you know, it's a big possibility that it could have been, you know, disease or something like that, and it could be easily explainable. Uh, the death, but but the head was missing, and and that didn't that make a lot of sense to me. He said, no, th- there's no anything on on the body that would say you know, they were being eaten or anything like that. The way he always described them was that one was perfect; they have no clue how it died, and the other that the head was just gone. And that's that's one of the the better reports that I've heard in the area. Um, and I've been collecting all sorts of stuff, and I have answers for absolutely none of it. But really you know it confuses me at the moment is all the the dogman reports you get in these sexes and i grew up uh not no one referred to it as dogman but being so close to louisiana uh you hear about the rougarou and you know when when i was young in middle school and first kind of heard about bigfoot and the rougarou i was like okay rougarou is what they call bigfoot and you talk to people and they say no it's it's canine it it's you know almost nothing like bigfoot i i just thought it was something they're missing i was like okay bigfoot exists it, they're they're seeing bigfoot and then crafting you know another creature around it and a lot of people say no that's that's not what we're what, what's happening and rougarou is actually an anglification of the medieval French word for werewolf, which is Lugaru. And I don't know that that's, what's been puzzling me at the moment, but with with kind of experiences like I had when I was younger, it gets kind of weird. And, and you wonder, it's a slippery slope. You wonder, you know, if this is real, then how much further does it go before, you know, it, it's just absolutely unexplainable. Right. It's, it's like, what is, what is reality? You know, it's one of those things where, you know, we we live in this preconceived reality that we've been told we live in. And then when you start shifting your focus off of what you're supposed to be looking at and you start looking around you start hearing people's stories and you start putting puzzle pieces together, you start thinking to yourself, what is real? What is this actually all about? And, you know, if, if I think that Bigfoot is real, well, what else is out there? Are these dogmen real? And I mean, I personally, I believe they are. And I don't know what they are, but it just really kind of shifts your paradigm to a point where you're like, um, I don't know what's real, what's not real. I don't know what this reality is, but uh, it, it's one of those things where either you kind of close the book, you put it to the side and you say, I, I don't want to touch that. Or you just dive into that wormhole and you take the red pill, you know? Yeah. So, uh, Christian, man, I appreciate you sharing these stories with us, man. It's been fascinating. And if you ever come across those, those photos, if you're able to recover them and stuff, I would love for you to forward them to me. And, uh, so I could see them very interested. Absolutely. I'll, I'll try to locate the, uh, yeah, I remember what the hard drive looks like and, and we've gone through a couple of moves since, so it could be anywhere, but I'll try to, uh, 
to locate that and see if I can recover anything. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok, email. I don't care how you share the show, but if you enjoyed it, please share the show with your friends because that is the best thing you can do to help the show grow. And until next week, friends, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel.